What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts, where things are never boring and usually quite controversial. Last week, I talked about coffee. So if you really want the controversial download on that, you should check out last week's Controversial Thoughts episode. This week, I want to do a little bit shorter and less technical video about differences between an animal-based diet and a paleo diet or a ketogenic diet. Just for those of you who don't know what an animal-based diet is, I wanna give you a basic idea of this, my conceptualization, how I think about this, how I really got here from a carnivore diet, and then talk about how it's different than a paleo diet and a ketogenic diet because those differences are quite important. So here are some pictures of animal-based diets um, on our beautiful heart and soil cutting board. And you can see there's a lot of color here, there's meat and there are some plant foods, but the plant foods are intentionally selected. So that's really the biggest difference between an animal-based diet in my mind and a paleolithic diet. Now, a paleolithic diet is a diet that begins to introduce this concept of a plant toxicity spectrum. On a paleo diet developed by Lauren Cordain originally and then popularized by Rob Wolf, I've done podcasts with both of them. They're on my podcast, which is Fundamental Health. You can find that at heartandsoil.co or Apple Podcasts. You're listening to it now. Um, but I've spoken to those guys in the past. The original thinking came, I think, from Boyd Eaton, who was a physician in 1985, an article written in the New England Journal of Medicine with this really important concept that the way that our ancestors have eaten, informed by anthropology, ethnography, study of current hunter-gatherers and some degree of archeology span might give us some indication of how humans should best eat in 2021 to obtain optimal health. Now, I think that's a very fundamental concept that I believe is true. I think that as humans, Though we are changing rapidly, I don't think we've changed enough in the last 10 to 15,000 years of pastoralism to eat a diet based on ag agriculture, to eat a diet based on grains and farming, to eat a diet based on seed oils, to live as far from the wilderness as we do currently, to spend as much time on digital platforms as we do currently, to be as disconnected from other humans as we are currently, to not get sun like we used to. I think there's so much that we're missing from our past that will lead us to optimal health in the present, and that's been forgotten about. And that's what the remembering is all about. And so in a paleolithic context, like Lauren Cordain and then Rob Wolf suggested, what was eliminated? From the plant kingdom, it was mostly grains and beans. And remember that grains and beans and nuts and seeds are all seeds. They're all plant reproductive babies. But in the case of a paleo diet, nuts and seeds were originally included and then suggested to be excluded on an autoimmune paleo diet. But grains and legumes are felt to be the more toxic sort of types of seeds. I totally agree with this. I think that things like beans and lentils are going to be very high in digestive enzyme inhibitors and lectins, not all of which can be degraded with cooking or even pressure cooking. So these are even things like saponins, tons of these compounds that really inhibit our digestion found in legumes and also grains. We know wheat is a huge offender. Wheat is a grain. It's full of lectins like gluten, which cause massive autoimmune issues for a lot of different people. And I think they're just better eliminated completely. So paleo was the beginning of a plant toxicity spectrum. I think autoimmune paleo was a further step in the right direction because really nuts and seeds are also seeds, just with grains and legumes, and they're similarly defended. They're similarly full of digestive enzyme inhibitors and things that prevent animals and humans from digesting those fully, causing lots of GI problems, whether it's gas or bloating or constipation, et cetera. Nuts and seeds are not really that digestible for humans either. So making a diet with a lot of nuts and seeds in it is just gonna to lead to major GI issues as well, something you don't want to happen. So autoimmune paleo was a step even further in the right direction. Autoimmune paleo begin to, began to think about things like nightshades as well, a whole genus of plants. In fact, it's a family of plants, excuse me, uh, that, that is full of lectins like solanine. It's also known as solanaceae. 
is the family of plants. It's full of lectins like solanine and chaconine, choconine that are pretty problematic for a lot of humans and cause autoimmune disorders. So autoimmune paleo says, okay, we're going to go further down the plant toxicity spectrum and exclude more of these plants. Now I see an animal-based diet as a further extension of autoimmune paleo with an addition of the importance of meat and organs. If we go back to the pictures of these animal-based diets, you can see, what do we have here? We have meat. Okay. That would be something that would be included on a paleolithic diet. It would be preferably grass-fed, grass-finished. Um, and we have what I consider to be the least toxic plant foods. These are things like fruit, berries, both sweet and non-sweet fruit. Here's some cucumber, which I think of as a non-sweet fruit, but it's still a fruit. We don't have avocado in this photo, but avocado, actually we do. Avocado is a non-sweet fruit as well. And then we've got some squash over here. These are all non-sweet fruits. So why do I differentiate between fruit here and other foods that are included on a paleolithic diet or an autoimmune paleo diet. When you think about things from the perspective of a plant, a plant doesn't really want its roots, its stems, its leaves, or its seeds to get eaten. So it's going to put digestive enzyme inhibitors, plant defense chemicals, all kinds of things in those. But that's, I think, where a paleolithic diet falls a little short. It doesn't take that into account. And if we look at hunter-gatherer tribes, they generally don't eat a lot of these foods unless they are pressed to. They will favor animal meat and organs and fruit over roots, stems, leaves, and seeds when given the chance. Generally speaking, there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, we see that pattern over and over. The Hadza, the Kaiwimeno of Amazon, um, Bantu tribes uh, of uh, Africa as well. And so it's this is the pattern, and this is what I hoped to capture with an animal-based diet. And I came from a carnivore diet, right? So I'm very interested, of course, originally in the incredible nutritive value of animal meat and organs. And you know, through Heart and Soil, this is what I do. This is my passion, getting you guys desiccated organs liver, heart, kidney, spleen, pancreas, colostrum, soon to be testicle and ovaries, uh, and some new supplements we're getting, some collagen is coming, all kinds of important organs to complement the muscle meat because this is clearly what hunter-gatherer tribes do. This is clearly what our ancestors have done. And this organ-based nutrition has been left out of so many diets. In a paleolithic diet, traditionally, there's no attention to consumption of organ meats, just muscle meat. Now, Weston Price, type ideas got the organs correct. And I think that we can do better by making a diet that is a little more diverse than a straight up nose to tail carnivore diet, because it'll make it easier for more people to do. And ultimately that allows more people to benefit from this way of eating. This is the genesis of an animal-based diet. So an animal-based diet is meat and organs, right? It's nose to tail. We're adding organs into a paleolithic diet, either fresh or desiccated like we make at Heart and Soil. If you guys need more organs, check us out at heartandsoil.co. We're going to get beef organs back in this week, all kinds of other good stuff there. In fact, the store is almost entirely full, bone marrow and liver, colostrum, immunomilk, lifeblood, heart of the warrior. It's all there for you. Get the organs in your diet with well-raised meats, and then think about the plant toxicity spectrum that was originally created by a paleolithic diet refined an autoimmune paleo. And I think we're going to refine that one more step and say, I think that all of us, you, me, are going to feel better by leaving out nuts, seeds, grains, legumes, and also leafy greens. So you'll see here on the pictures of these animal-based diets, there are no leafy greens because the leaves of plants are really not worth the effort. And they're really not worth all of the defense chemicals that are going to be in there. What we have here are a variety of animal foods. Here's soy and corn-free chicken, pasture-raised soy and corn-free eggs. Uh, there's seafood, this is some kidney, along with fruit. And the fruit, like I said, can be sweet or non-sweet fruit. There's some watermelon here, some other melon, some avocado is non-sweet fruit. This is bone broth. Again, we're thinking nose to tail with this kidney and this bone broth. And then there's heart over here, liver here, and berries here. Again, these are soy and corn-free eggs, or even honey is something that's often eaten by hunter-gatherer tribes and can be included. And then there's a little bit of extra animal fat here, the suet, which we know is high in stearic acid. That's why we make this fire starter supplement to get people suet and the important animal fats of stearic acid if they're not getting this easily. 
If you don't have uh, a lot of fat in your diet, especially a lot of animal fat, fire starter could be super helpful. If you're getting fatty steaks like this ribeye here, you could you don't even need this suet in your diet, but we put it there because it's so nutritious. But it can be things like cucumber. Again, this is a non-sweet fruit. It's packaging the seeds. A squash is a fruit. These are not vegetables. They are not roots, stems, leaves, or seeds in these diets. So that's the idea with an animal-based diet. That's how it's different than paleo. It adds in organs and it refines the spectrum of plant toxicity a little further. Now, in case this is not clear, we've provided all these resources for you guys as part of the Animal Based 30. You can join us, animalbased30.com. We're doing it this month. It's a reset. You can see, as I've listed here, this graphic is available on my social media and at Heart and Soil Supplements social media on Instagram. The least toxic are avocados, berries, squash, cucumbers, apples, oranges, olives, honey, dates. These are all fruit, sweet and non-sweet fruit. These are the types of plants, plant foods that plants are really not as worried about you eating. I'm anthropomorphizing here, of course, but they're not defending it as much. The more toxic beans and legumes, we talked about that, leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, not a fan of those, though everybody else is. Leave them out. I think it'll be better. You get the organs on an animal-based diet. You don't need any of the nutrients here. And really the organs are going to provide you with all the nutrients you need. Leave out the nightshades, leave out nuts and seeds, leave out grains, super controversial, leave out coffee and tea, as I said next week, and I'll do a video about why I think you're probably even best to leave out mushrooms in the future. The gist there is really that mushrooms are in the ground as well, and they're going to be defended. There are tons of defense chemicals in mushrooms. The majority of mushrooms are frankly toxic and will kill you if you eat even a little bit of them. So realize mushrooms are highly defended. I don't believe there are a lot of unique nutrients in mushrooms that you can't get from eating nose to tail animal foods, plus the least toxic plant foods, as we've talked about. If you join us for the Animal Based 30, I'll send you a link to this infographic that I built, how to eat an animal-based diet. Did a ton of work on this, what to eat, grass-fed beef, pasture-raised pork that is not corn and soy fed, chicken, organ meats, bone broths, fish, corn and soy-free eggs, the low toxic foods, as I just mentioned with a graphic here suggesting how much organ meat to get, either as fresh or desiccated, Medium toxicity foods are kind of in the middle and the most toxic foods are over here. So this is not a, an in-depth video about an animal-based diet. I'm mostly highlighting the differences, but you can get this whole infographic if you join us for animalbased30.com. It's free. I built it for you guys. And I want to make it very clear how I think this diet could be eaten in the best way. And I think it will lead to really profound health for a lot of us. There's even macronutrient breakdowns and calculations over here. So that's how I think an animal-based diet is different than a paleolithic diet, right? We're going to say, mm, maybe leave out the leafy greens, leave out the nuts and seeds, focus on animal meat and organs, the highest quality foods, and the least toxic plant foods. Now, if you had any doubts about this kind of thing, you can look at articles. There's been tons of anthropologic studies of hunter-gatherer cultures. This is one of my favorite articles I've talked about before um, on the Hadza. And the title of the Hadza, uh, the title of the paper is Tubers as Fallback Foods and Their Impact on Hadza Hunter Gatherers. So tubers are essentially the roots, but as you'll see here in this paper, they talk about the types of foods that are eaten by the Hadza. Generally, they fall into these five categories, tubers, berries, meat, baobab, and honey. Baobab is a fruit that grows on the baobab tree. And they're ranked here for men and women. And in both men and women, the most preferred food is honey. In men, the second most preferred food is meat. In women, the second, third, and fourth foods are all about the same preference, and they are meat, berries, and baobab. In both men and women, tubers are the least preferred food. They're really a fallback food. And what's not included in this list? Leafy greens, nuts, seeds. None of these foods we think of as canonical vegetables because they really don't serve a great role for many hunter-gatherer tribes unless they are frankly really not getting enough nutrients elsewhere. That's what an animal-based diet as I designed it, as I'm thinking of it and sharing it with you guys is designed to help us all understand what are the most preferential foods that lead us to the greatest health as humans. As we've really in 2021 hacked the algorithm and we can be the ultimate hunters and gatherers, we can always go to the grocery store. You can always order from regenerative farms like White Oak, Belcampo, Force of Nature Meats. You can always get our supplements at hardensoil.co. You can always get meat and organs and the least toxic plant foods. That's a really, that's a really um, privileged place for us to be as humans. 
And that's a formula for optimal health when all those things are available. Don't be confused by the fact that in survival situations, hunter-gatherer tribes may go to less preferential foods as Frank Marlowe says in the Hadza video, in the Hadza paper, fallback foods. So one more article I wanna show you guys here, which is a fascinating paper that I've showed in the past, marked improvement in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism in diabetic Australian Aborigines after temporary reversion to a traditional lifestyle. So of course, they leave their urbanized diets full of seed oils and processed carbohydrates, which are gonna be grains that are ground up into flour and their carbohydrate and lipid metabolism improved. What do these people eat? They ate essentially animal-based diets. <laughs> they ate beef, kangaroo, turtle, bream, yams, honey. They ate kangaroo, freshwater fish, yams, honey and figs, birds, crocodile, turtle, yabbies, which are like crawfish. And in the coast, they ate fish, birds, kangaroo, and crocodile. That's an exclusively animal-based diet, totally carnivore. So this is the indigenous diet of the Aborigines, complete reversal of underlying metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance. People will always say there are no studies with a, a carnivore diet or an animal-based diet. There absolutely are. There's a published study showing significant improvements in overall metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance with this way of eating. And look for the podcast next week on Tuesday with Sean O'Mara, in which we show really striking evidence of reversal of both cerebrovascular atherosclerosis in the brain and visceral fat with the transition to animal-based diets. So these diets are powerful. These diets are the way that we are programmed to eat as humans. I believe this is the real species appropriate diet for humans. This is the way we should be eating. And this is the simplest, easiest way to allow most people to get animal meat and organs, but to also have variety in their diet, which will make the diet more doable long-term. I love carnivore diets. I love fully animal-based carnivore diets without any plants, but for most of us, it includes, including some plants is gonna make it much more doable. So let's think about the spectrum of plant toxicity and make it more sustainable long-term. Join us for the Animal Base 30 this month. Sign up for the newsletter at heartandsoil.co. Check us out at heartandsoil.co if you need desiccated organs in your life. I'll do another video in the future about how an animal-based diet is different than a ketogenic diet. But if you've listened to my stuff in the past, you know that I have some concerns about long-term keto. And I do feel that there are benefits to at least cyclic consumption of moderate amounts of carbohydrates. So stay tuned for that. Check out the podcast on Tuesday with Sean O'Mara. It's going to blow your mind. Check us out at hardensoil.co. Stay radical, you guys. It is snowing in Texas today as I'm recording this. And when you are listening to this, I'm going to be snowboarding in Montana. So if you're in Whitefish, Montana, look for me on the mountain or in the backcountry this week. Love you all. Talk to you soon.